for everybody. Can you hear? All right. Well, thanks everybody for attending. Um, and it's an honor to be a speaker here and sit among my sisters. They're, they're my sisters. And in our Indian way, um, you know, our, our mother, their mother, Jerry Abihel, took me in a long time ago as her son. And then gaining two great women here. Um, so it's, it's more we of a personal him too. collection. We claimed you too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, um, you know, as Alicia said, um, when I was in IAIA, I actually took a beadwork class. And I didn't really need it, but it was like, oh, good, easy A. And now Terry works me really hard. <laughs> so it was like one of those things where she's like, no, 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 no. You've got different projects to work on. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll introduce, um, I'm going to let these two kind of introduce themselves because you've read, read what uh, the news press and everything says about them. But the, the way I know them, you know, Terry is a, a bead worker, um, sculptural artist, mother, gardener, um, and sister as well as uh, Carrie here. Um, she's multi, multi uh, artist as well. Um, jeweler, painter. Uh, she used to do beautiful artistic landscaping. Um, so many of you don't know that there's more to that aspect too, but we can get into that in a little bit. Um, so just again, thank you very much and um, we'll get started. So go ahead, Terry. Just tell us a little bit about yourself and your 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 background. First off, thank you to SAR for inviting us to be a part of this conversation, my sister and I, and having my brother Ken being the moderator is really <coughs> awesome. I was an SAR fellow here in 2003. Um, I was pregnant with my second son when I was here, and uh, pulling in here every time I come in here it gives me good feelings because. Um, my son was, you know, he was a two and a half at the time, and I was pregnant with um, my son, and we spent, you know, this was where he was playing and all of that. And um, Daniel and the rest of the crew wanted me to have my baby while I was here, and I was like, no, I cannot, because I needed to nest first and get prepared for this baby to come, and we were up at the artist house. But anyway, that's my, I have a connection to this place. Um, actually, even before I got the fellowship, my mother had been docenting here for quite a while as a volunteer, and that's how I actually got introduced to the collections here and to this place, um, to SAR, to the School of American Research. And um, some of the best docenting programs that I've ever been a part of, actually, here, and I tell everyone about it whenever they ask me. So we grew up on the Wind River Reservation in Wyoming, on the Shoshone side of the reservation. There, our mother had a trading post. Um, we grew up in that trading post she had. She was there for over 25 years, and um, eventually she moved here to Santa Fe. And after I did a stint in California, um, and I graduated from college there, then I moved here. And by that point, my sister was here too, and I haven't left. So, um, and I started beading when I was very, very young, surrounded by beadwork in my mother's trading post and all that. And, um, and then ended up, I actually came here thinking I was um, going to go to law school at UNM because they have the finest native law program in the US, and I wanted to fight, and the best way to fight was to do it legal through law. And um, I got sidetracked because um, I was all planning to get my, take my LSATs, and then I um, did my first show, which was Eight Northern Pueblos, um, and that was a really good show. I sold out, and then the next year, I got into Indian Market, and I sold out, and the next year after that, I won Best of Show. And when all of that happened, then that's what I realized. <laughs> That, um, that I could also fight through art. And so that is what I've been doing. And she answered all the questions I was gonna ask her. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, great. So go ahead, Carrie, tell us a little bit about you. Thank you for having us, and thank you, Sara, for having us. It's really nice to see all the friendly faces out there. And I, we, all of us appreciate you coming and listening. And um, I have the, uh, blessing of being the uh, little sister, so I just let her do the, do the main, main, <laughs> main copy. But um, so, yeah. so um, after the Wind River Res, um, when my mom actually moved here to Santa Fe and my sister was off in California being a hippie, she was actually a deadhead. <laughs> I went to the East Coast and went to school on the East Coast. I went to a boarding school outside of uh, Boston and then I went to Rhode Island School of Design and 
that's really where I, I knew when I was a child, like when I was a baby, that I was going to be an artist. There was never like any question in my mind. At one point, when I think I was like eight or nine years old, I read something about how um, Leonardo da Vinci used to uh, uh, d dissect human beings in the mortuary. And I thought, maybe I should be a mortician so I could learn about anatomy. So that was like my one brief moment that I thought I should be something other than an artist. So um, I was pretty clear from a, a child what my path was going to be. And I, uh, my, um, I actually have a degree in painting and in art history. Um, painting really became one of my first loves. And um, that's what I was studying at RISD. And then I later studied it at, at a, um, II. II was not an accredited school for a four-year college at the time. Otherwise, I would have gotten my degree there. So I got an associate's degree there and then finished my degree at uh, the College of Santa Fe, which actually no longer exists. Um, and the reason I did it at the College of Santa Fe is because at that point I had was old enough and more established enough, like I had a dog and you know, was I gonna take my dog back to Providence and his cow dog and you know, see so the older you get you start making decisions that are more um, you're a little less foot uh, foot loose and fancy free. Uh -huh. So, um, and then also making a living. So, you know, I had to make a living, so which uh, uh, manifested its way in different manners. I'm primarily as a landscape designer, uh, which I did for a while, and then uh, and then was able to transition eventually into making making art full time. And my jewelry making started um, as a class at the community college and uh, here in Santa Fe. And so I'm uh, fairly self-taught, although that's sort of a um, not totally true because there's such a huge community of jewelers in the Santa Fe area and the jewelers I have found more so than in other medias are incredibly um, embracing of each other and we call each other up for help for to borrow tools to borrow metal to you know if I'm there's been a number of times that I'm like I just broke that stone and my show is tomorrow <laughs> on the phone and, and you know one of my buddies will show up with their parcel of stone so so um Self-taught, but also community-taught in, in terms of what my, my chosen medium is. Great. That was all my questions, too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Terry, you know, I, I know you've been um, beating for a long time since you mentioned a, a child. Um, growing up in Wind River on the reservation, I know <laughs> mom had a trading post there, and people would bring their items in to sell. Um, did any of that inspire you at a young age? Were there certain pieces that you'll never forget that ran through her hands at that time? Carrie and I both were brought home in a fully beaded Kiowa cradle board from the hospital. Um, it was the same cradle board. It had been made for uh, me when I was born, but really made for us, made for our family, by my mother and my father. And um, so from the moment I was born, I was, brought home in beads. And so um, my mother had this closet, and I've told this story, and some of you probably already heard it, but my mother had this closet, and Carrie and I would go in, it was just this tiny little closet, but we would go in there and it had a little light, and she had all her moccasins in these cubbies, and she had all her necklaces hanging on the wall, and she had like other, all this beautiful stuff in there, and we'd go into that closet, and we would turn off the, we'd close the door and turn off the light, and we just sit in there and smell the smoked hide and touch those cool glass beads, like the tactileness of those beads um, and the smell of that smoked hide and being in our mother's little closet. And so, um, so it was always around. I don't know how else to say it other than beads have been always around. Like just from the moment I was born, my grandmother, who was born in a teepee at the end of the Indian Wars, she danced in the ghost dance to make the white people go away. She uh, only had a sixth grade education. She was a boarding school kid, ran away and all of that. <coughs> when, uh, when she was older and you know, all they trained them to do at that time was uh, for menial work, you know, like working in the kitchens or yeah, domestic servant or farming. And um, so that's what my grandma did, pick cotton and all that kind of stuff, but she beaded her entire life. And she would come out here to gallop ceremonials and compete and win. I have some of her winning ribbons, like the little, the, you know, the little things they fill out for you and all that. And um, it was in the newspaper. She'd win at the Oklahoma State Fair. She went at Anadarko Fair. She was beating her entire life. And she was an artist. And she made money off that beadwork to raise not only her kids, 
but also several grandsons. So it's, it's in, it's like a part of, and it, and it comes from a long way, and it comes through me, and hopefully it'll go on to the next generation. So as far as like any particular object that, in, I don't know if it inspired me, but um, my mother had this bag, there, my, lots of people knew about my mother's trading post, and when they would come through, they would stop off and they would sell her stuff, make enough gas money, and they could get on. Um, so there were these northerners, these Canadians that had come down, and they had these, they had a whole bunch of stuff with them, but what they, what she bought from them were these purses made out of moose hide, and moose hide's thick, it's, it's like really thick felt, it's very different than the hide we were used to on Wind River. And so the hide was different, that moose hide was different, it smelled different because it was a different kind of wood they were using to smoke it. And on the outside of it was this floral. And I thought at first, because when we were little, you would play with sequins and beads, you know how you put the sequins on. That's what it looked like. And I was like, sequins? And my mom said, no, they're not sequins. She said, those are frisk scales dyed. Mm -hmm. And so that piece, I actually have one of those bags still. Mm -hmm. And um, that piece, I guess in my mind, it was like, oh, like <coughs> anything. You know, like anything can be used. You can figure out how to make materials out of anything. Uh, that's genius. That's native art genius is what that is. Cool. Yeah, and I, I don't know if a lot of people knew Jerry, and she always had the most unusual things that she would dress and prepare to go out into the public, and she had some of the best beadwork and jewelry. And, you know, that was always really cool. Um, Carrie, kind of the same question, you know, I know you do beadwork too sometimes, and mostly it's for family. Um, you know, growing up in the trading post, do you remember seeing things or do you remember being inspired at an early age by certain things to get you to kind of the point where you're at now, or do you remember some of those things that were important? Absolutely. They, um, I remember mom actually had the practice of whenever she got something, got something particularly interesting interesting she would get my sister and I were uh, uh, tutored at home we were schooled at home and um, so we had a really sort of very open schedule which I think actually has allowed us to be the artist that we are because just mon part of being an artist is you really monitor your own time and you deal with your own time and, and so you have to figure out what works best for you and what you're going to be the most productive because we were homeschooled from like, the get-go we would like take off for the summer because our parents wanted us to do that or we would just you know work through the whole week or like I, like I would get up, I'm a morning person, she's a night person and I would get up really early, do all of my schoolwork from six o'clock in the morning to like eight because I wanted to go play and get it checked off and then by nine or 10 I was done with school. And so we were allowed to, to um, so that was sort of a side, side story, but um, so she would come into the schoolroom and pull us out if, she, if something interesting came into the store and she also had us working in the store so that we would see all of these items and we would also, she would have us meet the people because it wasn't just, it wasn't enough for us to come in later to see the items. She wanted us to meet the people who had made these items and talk to these ladies. And you know, they were from all over the place because we were on a, a 285, which was the main highway going through um, Wyoming. 287. Or 287, sorry. <laughs> 285 is up here. <laughs> They're living here too long. <laughs> Um, uh, yeah, so um, I remember that fish scale bag. I remember the lady who made that fish scale bag. Um, I remember the par fleshes in this in the store, and I and I inherited when mom passed away. I inherited her buffalo horn spoon collection, and in that buffalo horn spoon collection, there's also some other tools, hide scraping tools, and some um, um, uh, uh, rattles made out of rawhide. And I remember touching those and and being familiar with those as a child and wondering like how they were made. And so recently, last year and the year before, I did a whole bison um, horn collection and I'm working on some quill work collection. Now my new collection that's coming out is gonna be based on quill work. And what, so what I'm in, interested in is value systems and um, in my work. So I find it really interesting that things that, value systems are, are just put upon, that we put upon ourselves, human beings, regardless of our culture, we put them upon ourselves. So with, within the jewelry world, there's things that are deemed valuable because someone has told us they were valuable. De Beers told us that diamonds are valuable. So diamonds are valuable, right? There's less bison horn on this planet than there are diamonds. So 
working with bison horn is really, really hard. It's very stinky, it's labor intensive. Working with these quilts is incredibly labor intensive. I'm like dying to help share it. Like, she's like, you haven't been making jewelry? And I'm like, no, I've been trying to like learn this quilt work because it's just, it's so labor intensive and difficult and, and time consuming. And so, but people look at it, they look at beadwork and they're like, oh, that's not valuable, but they look at diamonds and they say that's valuable because they've been told it, it's valuable. So what I'm interested in is, is, is combining those different value systems from different cultures, the things that we find valuable, dentalium shells with 22 karat gold, because not one piece, they both come from this earth, right? Not one is more valuable than the other, it's just what we have been programmed. That Notre Dame thing is a perfect example of this. It's what we've been programmed as to what's valuable. So that totally was a sidebar of your question, <laughs> but to answer your question, I, I have been hugely influenced by the objects and the things that my mom collected and that we grew up around and the particular women who made those objects. Yeah, and I think that was kind of like their mom's connection with people. Um, it was a connection with the person, not just like, oh, let me sell your stuff and get out of here, take a hike, it was like, are you sure you have enough gas money to get home? You know, well, she told me this story one time about, you know, looking, this lady brought a beaded dress in and she had to sell it. The lady was like sleeping in her car and had to sell that heirloom to make ends meet to feed her kids. So I think like what Carrie was saying is it's, you know, a lot of our art, some people think it's more valuable than others, but, um, you know, I think those connections you make with one another are just as valuable. I'm gonna tell a story. So one of the things is one of my pastimes is scoping eBay. I love looking at eBay, beadwork on eBay. <laughs> so I found this um, a piece of beadwork. It was a, a coin purse, and it wasn't a particularly small bead or anything. It was just really unusual design, and I was like, I gotta have it, you know. So I bid on the auction, and I want it, and I was like super stoked. And when I got it home, I unzipped it, and what was inside? There was a tag in my mother's handwriting. <laughs> with the name of the person who made the piece and in her little code, and it was, I could tell, because I knew how to read her code, because she put all of her price tags in code. It was $25, which told me that she had sold it like in the, like, the 60s or 70s. It was a while ago. But the fact that it was, in a, that she was conscious of writing the artist's name on every piece that came through her, her, her store. Anyone who has done collection work knows that that those words ring like gold in your ears. And God bless the person who owned that, who never took that tag out, right. you know? Because yeah. it was clearly, it was a used bag, like she used it, or he used it, whoever used it, and then put that tag back in. So how much was it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I always have to know. Okay. More than $25. <laughs> So, uh, Carrie, this question is kind of for you again, too. You know, I know in your artistic background, you're very diverse with what you do. You know, your jewelry is, uh, I guess, um, different theme based, different years. Um, you used to be a painter, you used to uh, do landscaping. What kind of inspired you or made you go full time into jewelry? Um, jewelry for me is fascinating, it's infinitely fascinating because there's always something to learn. There's always a new technique, there's always a new tool out there. there I could do this until I die and still be learning something. And I'm, I'm currently teaching a class at the community college, which I teach a class occasionally, like every five years I'll teach a class. Part of why I do it is to get myself out of my hole, one thing, and interact with other people. And also just to like that sharing, I feel like I have an obligation because I do have a certain knowledge base at this point of how to make things. And I feel like as an artist, it is my obligation to share that information especially in such a digital day and age, that it is my obligation to share with other people how to actually move their hands to move metal to, you know, or to whatever it is my skill is. And that, um, so I think, Joy, I think because it, there, it's infinite in what you can learn and that you can continue learning and there's new things coming up constantly is what actually has me captivated by it. In addition to the fact that adornment is, I think, of. Um, well, adornment is, as a native thing, I mean, there's so much information in, in adornment. Like, when you go to ceremonies or whatever, or powwows or whatever, you can read outfits. You can go, like, you know, in contemporary world, you watch those fancy dancers out there, and a lot of them have, like, the ball gate, ball teams, or whatever, I'm not a, a ball person, but have, like, you know, the Denver Broncos, fully beaded, 
you know, they're all of their, whatever they're interested in, it's like, and that's, you know, their expression of themselves. Like, you know whose sports team they're after, you know, the more traditional ones, you know who's, you know, who, who they belong to and where they belong, and information on their family written into their adornment. And I think that jewelry is, is a way to communicate also because we all, I mean, a lot of us like to adorn ourselves just going out to the grocery store or whatever, and you can have a conversation about what this piece is and who made it and, and, and open up that. I watched my mom do that with the way she presented herself and dress, that she had a beautiful platform to very congenially have a conversation about colonialism, you know? And it was, and so that the power of adornment is, is, um, is really striking to me. So that's one of the other reasons why I make jewelry. Cool. So Terry, you know, and, and, and many of Terry's creations are multifaceted too. She has a very diverse background. Um, you know, what's kind of your favorite medium? Do you lo like, I know you've experimented with large scale beaded kind of pictorial paintings, sculptural aspects, jewelry, you know, what, what do you really like? What's, what's fun for you to do? Or what excites you? Actually, yes. <laughs> that's, not a, that's not actually off, really. Yeah. Um, you know, she what, told me two years ago she's going to make me put mocks. Just saying. I still, <laughs> I still have your footprint pattern, all right? I got your measurement. Um, Unless your foot is grown. Um, well, uh, as I've gotten through, you know, the years stack upon themselves, um, initially, Initially, I guess I would, um, well, I'm driven by stories, like telling stories. That's what drives me. And so the, the thing that I'm making ha is a part of the story I'm telling. So whatever that story is at the moment that I'm trying to tell, that's, that's you know, the object has to be a part of that. Um, lately, however, um, with the work I've been doing for this exhibit that I've been working on for five million years, um, I really and, and going into the collection visits and all of that and try and um, understanding something that I knew all along that these things that these historic objects, the terminology, these historic objects that we um, that we see in collections of in private and public collections that all of these objects were made with prayer. They were all made with purpose and intent. Not a one of them wasn't made with someone in mind. And so that's very different to make art like that than it is to make art for Indian Market, for your booth, for a gallery. That there is a disconnect between what you're making and why you're making it. What are you making it for? To hang it on a wall? To, to sell it for money? Like, what is the purpose of it? With the traditional pieces made for people in that old way, there is no question about what you're doing and why you're doing it. You've been asked, and you have to think about it, and you have to pray on it. You have to, and you have to, you know, you have to connect to what it is that you're making. And so, I've been making so much, you know, I've been, and I, it's not that I don't enjoy it. I love making the big art pieces and all of that. That's it's it's a lot of fun, but um, remembering the the reasons why this medium was used in the first place, and the purpose of it, and the, um, the necessity to keep doing that. Um, I don't do that work for money. There's no money exchange when I do that work. Um, my payment comes when I see it being danced in. That's my payment. So um, I guess, I don't know, that's a kind of a roundabout question. I like making whatever I'm making at the time. As of late, I guess it's, it's this thing. And how to bring, I guess, also then, on this next piece that I have, after this, after this puppy's born, uh, I've got this other piece that's just been, it's been in my head for about five years now, and I'm, it's like, ugh, I gotta get it out. But this is, it's gonna be driven in a different way. I, I already know it. So, anyway, yeah. So, did, <laughs> so when you won Best of Show at Indian Market, did that kind of change things for you, or, you know, because that was, um, you know, was that a, a point for you to decide, okay, this is what I'm going to do, or, you know, can you tell us a little bit about that point in your life? Yeah, that was a, that was a major shift, because like I said, I had come here to go to UNM, to go to law school, and um, 
uh, well, to be near my mom and my sister too, but like, you know, go to UNM. And um, when I won Best of Show, that was literally when I realized that I, like, okay, I can, I can, uh, I can speak through beadwork. I can speak through this medium. And, um, and so that's what I, that's what I did. It, yeah, it did. It, it made it, it I, what I realized wasn't that I had a career. I could, I could have a career if I worked hard. <coughs> this, one of the things I noticed about my sister's work, and see, I'm formally trained as an artist, you know, whatever, and um, it had that intention since a child, and so went down that path, and Terry had a different path, and her drawings are extraordinary. I think she's really one of the best draftsmen that, that I know, and she's like, what? No, she's like, yeah, see, she doesn't have that, have that psyche or ego involved in it, but I, I actually went through her notebooks one day and I was in her studio and I was like, holy moly, like this is like really impressed with her, her drawing skills and I, I don't know why I'm bringing this up other than it's a totally different approach to making work that she comes from, which is a very authentic and unique to her individual. And I appreciate her as an artist and it's kind of like learning, like my perception of her is that she was told that she was an artist rather than like, like, you know, she was told. I, um, I, it was years before I could call myself an artist. When people ask me, and to this day, and I do this on purpose, to this day when people ask me what I am, I say I'm a bead worker. Because I claim bead working as a medium, as you are a sculptor, as you are a painter, as you are a jeweler, these are all okay, and that's understood, but when you say you're a bead worker, and you're like, huh, what is this? I don't know this, right? So that's why I say that. I don't say that I'm an artist. I say I'm a bead worker. My grandma was a bead worker. My great grandma was a bead worker. I'm a bead worker. See, if you call that art, fine. But I'm a bead worker. And I'll change it up. I'll, I'll call myself a jeweler, layman, whatever, I'm a jeweler. If I'm in a room full of jewelers, I call myself an artist. <laughs> and the reason I do that is because most jewelers that I know are right. trained as jewelers. And there's this, like, there's a training and the way of thinking about jewelry, and that's why rings are all round, right? <laughs> I approach jewelry as <coughs> rings aren't necessarily round. I'm, I approach it as an artist because I was trained as a painter, as an art historian. I grew up with all of this beadwork and all of these different materials as a landscaper. And, you know, I'm making things out of like the objects. Like jewelry doesn't have to be made out of metal and and stones. Jewelry can be made out of feathers and plants, and it can be made of all this stuff. So, so if I'm in a room full of jewelers, I'm an artist. If I'm in a room full of people, I'm people of jewelry. And that was kind of like my next question for uh, you, Carrie. Was like, you know, see, they're they're not. They don't need me. Um, no, it was kind of like you always have great themes about your pieces. Sometimes it's underwater stuff, sometimes it's bugs. Um, what, how does that evolve for you? Like, do you see different things on your trips when you travel abroad? Um, uh, what inspires those different collections of different works? And you'll notice she doesn't repeat it. So like if she does bugs or something, it's like, okay, I'm done with that. Cause one time I asked her, will you make another one of this? And she's like, mm, not really, but. Um, so what, what kind of, what, what feeds that fire? Um, I, I realized that I actually can, can be kind of a literal person. Like, I did all that archery stuff when I was practicing archery. <laughs> I was doing the bugs when I was doing a lot of landscaping. <laughs> doing a lot of bugs. So I did, I, I'm, on a certain level, um, like when I first started getting into actually going to the ocean and, and I'm learning how to sail now and like learn that, that's what started the ocean series, and I'm gonna. I can, that ocean series pops up occasionally, and I'm, st I'm still not done with it. I haven't closed that one yet, but um, <coughs> it's really like an experience, or or what? Yeah, it's an experience of what I'm doing, and this <coughs> working with the porcupine quills and the buffalo horn and the um, that. I'm also driven by narrative, but that's also this is. I'm at. I feel like I'm at. I'm kind of maturing right now. There's like there was a transformation that happened after my mom passed away. I spent the first year um, just trying to make jewelry and um, just trying to do stuff. And so what I did was I actually she always wore jewelry. So I took a lot of her things that were like very personal to her that she wore a lot. Um, that I had associations with her wearing, and I remade those pieces into my with my own. Um, and this ring is actually an example of that. She used to wear this little tiny Fred Harvey ring that was like you know mass-produced Fred Harvey ring. It was made out of silver, 
and I turned it into my own ring, and in, I put it in gold, I switched the shank around, I put my signature diamond on the bottom, so that helped me actually start making jewelry again. Um, and then there was a maturing process that I feel like has happened to me in the last four years in, in my career, and that's where this sort of talking about the, the value systems is coming out of that. And so I'm not, that's maybe not quite as literal as I'm doing archery and here's some arrow earrings, yeah. but it's, it, um, that's where that, the work is coming from now. Yeah, so inspiration <coughs> everywhere. Yeah. Um, and either of you could answer kind of this, you know, growing up in this history of art and, you know, being around objects so much, you know, I know that um, your mom, she always like, liked seeing what was new, what was exciting, who was creating what. She used to love to see young people and she would like heavily support a lot of these artists. Um, you know, come to your booth early, help you out. Um, you know, when I went to IAIA, that's when her and I became really close because one time she came for an art show and we went to eat in the cafeteria and she says, you eat this crap? <laughs> I was like, what? She says, no, 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 okay, Sunny Boy. She was, used to call me Sunny Boy. She'd say, I'm gonna cook for you. You know, one time um, she wrote me an excuse from Terry's class because I was at her house eating. <laughs> And I think I had had like maybe one too many margaritas too, and I was like, oh, no, 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 no. So I had to give Terry this like written letter, like, you are gonna excuse Sunny Boy from class. You know? um, I have a good story to tell because one time they showed up at my mom and uh, kids showed up at my house wearing matching jackets. <laughs> they were like, the, <laughs> the child she always wished she had is turning into like, <laughs> oh, yeah, we were like, clothing now? Okay, I guess it's cool. She's like, oh my God, magic jackets. They were magic jackets too. <laughs> Oh, um, so kind of growing up in this, you know, uh, um, history of items and objects always being around you, you know, looking at, you know, what we're talking about, innovation, you know, there were so many of these, these great pieces that I knew she collected that were very innovative for the time. Um, you know, did these kind of influence your work, you know, seeing them so much, or was it just kind of like, oh yeah, I remember that painting being there all the time, you know, do you remember any of these things that were kind of like, holy crap, like, wow, this is, like, super exciting for, like, 1983 or something like that. That would be fully beaded Converse tennis shoes <laughs> that came into my mother's trading post. They were Lakota made, and they, she got a red pair and I think a gray pair, that's what I remember, maroon, red, and gray, and both of them were made uh, in the same style as those Lakota ladies bead and quill. And, you know, those Lakota ladies are well known for beading and quilling anything, everything, right? And that actually comes out of the trading post system up north them, there for them, because they had those white men would come in, they married them families, they'd open up that trading post, and they'd have all them women working for them in that trading post making stuff. And so that's how come you see cowboy hats and, and cowboy boots and doctor's bags and all that stuff, because them traders were having these women making these unusual beating on these unusual objects. So that's where the trading system and what is produced ends up being you know, conjoined. My mother, definitely, I experienced that watching my mother, and I only know that now as an adult, thinking back on what she was doing, because she had these relationships with these different bead workers in the trading post, and she knew what the white ladies liked to buy. They, she knew their color palette. And so she would say to them, I know you guys really like these red roses, but why don't you do these roses in some sort of like neutral browns and tans and whatnot, because them ladies don't like bright colors. And, and those Shoshone ladies would come with a whole bunch of stuff in these brown and tan colors, and Damak Mom didn't sell all that stuff. And now when you go to Wind River, you will see these tan and brown colored thematics up there that comes right out of that interaction between the trading post, the, between consumers, the trader, and the, and, the, and the makers, right? And so Mother's influence, um, she, her influence, but also all of this innovative stuff, like you're saying, that's coming in, Fully beaded tennis shoes are not my idea. I saw those when I was, we saw those when I was like 11 or 12 years old when those came into my mom's trading post. They were phenomenal. They spoke to my sister and I in a way that none of the other, well to me anyway, the way that none of the other stuff spoke because they were really Indian looking but they were also really contemporary. And that was, that's me. That's like exactly the space I, in, you know, that I am. So uh, that's that. That was my attraction to it. So yeah, and I think, I mean, that's continued on. Um, 
I mean, I innovate with materials maybe and like that. I'm, uh, I'm, I am very particular though, like the techniques that I use are the techniques that those ladies taught me. Um, and I used to be really pilly about my materials. I only use brain tan, deer hide, smoked deer hide, the brain tan kind. Um, but I, I kind of loosened up a little bit as I, as I gone along and now I, because I'm so attracted to color, bright color planes, now I'll use colored leather and colored silks and all this kind of stuff. But that's, you know, I had very rigid ideas of what I wanted to do initially and tried to really stick by my rules that I had made. Um, but anyway, it's kind so of So what are your thoughts on like, I don't know if you watch YouTube videos or on line or whatever, but all like there's a lot of different ways to, to do beadwork and different techniques and people are like there's a lot more sharing now with amongst people who do I mean this is kind of a question for both of you, but what are your the thoughts on that communication that's happening through the internet on on technique of, of Well for me for me, now you might have a different opinion about this, but you know when I was teaching beadwork at I I I had this one older lady um, who was taking the class from me. Now she knew how to beat. I, it wasn't like, she, she was like, can I couldn't teach her no techniques or whatever, she already knew how to do it. I could just give her ideas. <laughs> and so um, she w we were working on this little bag and I had this method that I was trying to teach her about how to make this bag with this lining in it. And she had this other way that she was gonna do it. And I, I went to her and I said, well, you need to, this is how I'm doing And she got kind of mad at me. She was like, well, this is how my grandmother taught me how to do it. And I was like, I suddenly I was like, oh, shh, yeah, she brought a grandma. I'm like, I was like, I am not trying to tell you to do anything that you're uncomfortable with or that your grandma wouldn't teach you how to do. If you want to learn the way that I'm teaching you how to do it, then I, I can teach you this as well. You already know how to do that. I can teach you something new, but you know, no disrespect to grandma. And so I guess my point is, is that everyone has different ways that they're taught things. Just like our oral stories all are different whenever it's a different person telling it. Like the way that our story that we hear of, you know, Bear Lodge or whatever, Devil's Tower is different than told. It's told differently by different family members. So I guess I would say that it probably just depends on, I don't know about YouTube and all that, but I know information comes in all different ways. Do you find it interesting that all the like, Landmarks always get named like Devil's This, Hell's Kitchen. <laughs> I've, I've never understood, like, why are we? I mean, the Judeo Christian. Yeah. Sorry to talk. So, um, oh, and many of you don't know, these women here are excellent cooks and they grow their own produce. And one time we're, we were all going on, um, and they're very, like, it has to be this way, and it's really good. This is not edible food. We were going to Oklahoma, and everything was fried. And I thought, how are they going to survive and eat? They only eat like homegrown stuff. <laughs> um, anyways, but I think that that Wait in Rome. yeah. Wait in Rome. Um, and uh, your mom, she had a cafe too at the Trading Post. So did a lot of the locals tend to come to that, or were is it uh, bypassers? And do you remember, like, was she that had, part of your... She had the cafe before my sister and I were born, and she worked really hard. I mean, she tells stories of how, um, I can't... You know, and one of the things she always said to us is, never work in a restaurant. Never own a restaurant. Never own a restaurant. Never own a restaurant. <laughs> yeah. And I tried to work in a restaurant. It lasted about a week. <laughs> but, um, so we weren't actually part of the that part of the scene when she had the restaurant. She did have a... Um, she still had that cafe. Uh, cafe, so industrial kitchen. So we grew up with this ginormous stove that, like, you know, had the eight burners and the big, you know, whatever, and the, the grill and these giant sinks, the big stainless steel sinks. So we grew up in an industrial kitchen. And we grew up really rurally, and um, I don't think we had store bought meat until we were like 14 or something. Or Her dad was a hunter. We had rabbits. Rabbits. Yeah, we had rabbits and chickens, and that was like one of our jobs. Yes, we had to do like the every two months we had to butcher all the rabbits and. And we had, and we, one of my, actually one of my first ways, I think it was actually the first money we, we ever earned was we would trap beaver. And so we trapped the beaver and then Terry and I would each hold one of the beaver and like tromp through the snow from the river up and then we'd, we'd skin the beaver. Gross. And yeah, it's disgusting, it's really gross. Um, <laughs> and freeze them and our poor dogs had to eat them. We would saw them in half and then throw them, we would throw them, throw them in half to the yeah, there's pictures. Yeah, save our dogs. <laughs> <laughs> so we, but we would get the hat, a hot pan, 
so we had this stack of pelts in my mom's store, and we would get a cut on those on those pelts that so we she would sell. Yeah. yeah. So it was. Um, so that all of doing that, understanding where food comes from, and how you know how to prepare it, and then our Italian grandma would come out in September, and we would have a ball with her, and she was like, you know, she'd so make. Was, uh, Antelope cannelloni, <laughs> like the northern style yeah. crepes with the white, with the white yeah. and the red sauce, but with so animal. Yeah. Yeah. And then like uh, uh, grouse hearts, like a big pile of round polenta. With, with polenta? The, yeah, with the rosemary in it, and then a big pile of grouse hearts. And you'd be shooting the, the grouse from the during the animal hunting. So. Anyway, yeah, so you yeah, probably, so, yeah, that's all like fancy food now, but for us, Indian yeah. kids out in the middle of nowhere, which is what you ate. <laughs> <laughs> what you guys ate, because yeah. everybody else did it. <laughs> hey, we trade for commodities. What is it? We trade for commodities, the commodity cheese, all that stuff was good stuff. Yeah. And yeah, we, we trade, yeah. Yeah, we trade, we trade meat for that commodity. So before we kind of like start ending things before question and answer, um, can you both kind of tell us like an overview of what you're doing now, maybe about your, your husband, your kids, um, you know, what you're working on, something exciting, whatever you want to kind of talk about, fill us in what you're up to now. Well, I'm kind of, I already talked a little bit about my first time co-work, which I'm, is kicking my butt, so let's stay at all the collective prayer that I actually have work at Indian Market this year. Like, Look on her Facebook, she has a cute picture of a porcupine. He does. He's my new addition. Um, yeah, so I'm, I'm working on that, which is uh, really expansive for me, and it's difficult, and I'm hoping to have some interesting pieces that, that I have them. Yes, and then I'm also um, I'm learning how to sail, which is also kind of intimidating. Big boats, lots of water. I don't really know how to swim. <laughs> <laughs> you can stay afloat. Yeah, you know, with proper equipment. I'll let you guide it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm plugging along. I'm, uh, I may or may not plant a garden this year. I have a little garden, just a little plot that I'm doing. And I'm running. I made my goal of 600 miles last year, and I'm a little bit behind. I'm, so far, I'm up to, I think, 160 this year. Just putting one foot in front of the other. And then I'm going to go in June to go support this one, who so I'm So tell super us about proud. that, and share information about what you're so, doing. Um, I was really actually kind of upset at the end of last year because I realized I haven't made a major piece in over a year. Over a year. And I'm, I was like, what the hell is wrong with me? Like, why can't I just kick my ass in a gear and get something out? And then I realized that I had been working on this for five years now, and this is what I've been busy doing. I am co-curating an exhibition of Native Americans' work from prehistory through the present at the Minneapolis Institute of Art. I'm co-curating with Jill Alberg yo who's the head of Native American Arts there. She asked me about five years to do this. I said yes immediately because I saw it as an extension of my mother's work, her years of promoting women's work. And my also, you know, Jill comes, Pennsylvania lady, Pennsylvania Dutch, and so she comes at it from an anthropologist, East Coast point of view, but it occurred to her something that I always knew that we don't even discuss, which is that Native American art is made by women. Pottery, baskets, textiles, uh, beadwork, quill work, these are all mediums held by the women of their communities. And so when you go into a, a exhibition of historic Native American art, like the one that just opened at the Met, the Dyke Collection, the majority of what you're seeing in there is women's art. Um, and these are iconic. These are what the Met has deemed as iconic examples of. And when you're looking around that room, and I'm seeing 80% in there made by women, there's no text on the wall that says that. There's nothing written anywhere. There's no kind of consciousness of what we're seeing. And so that's what this exhibit is hoping, we are hoping to address in some way. That and the other thing, which is kind of two main points. One, claiming this work is women's work, first off. And second off, um, the idea of the curator as authority, as a single authority on what we are to be looking at and how we understand it does not work in Indian country. And so when Jill asked me to do this, the first thing I said to her was, I'll do it only if we have an advisory committee because I can't speak for Navajos. I can't speak for Lakotas. I can't speak for Arapahos. I can't speak for Seminoles or Chumash 
or any of these people. I can't speak for them. I can't even speak for my own. So to have one single idea of a single authority on, on top of all of that, dictating what is or isn't appropriate, just is it's an outrageous idea to me. And so we have this advisory committee. D.Y. is one of our advisors in abortion guidance. But um, uh, we had a, this large committee of women that helped us organize this, and um, we, uh, we got pushback. We got serious pushback. Um, Joe took a lot of heat for giving up what is called curatorial control because in the museum world, in the art world, this is not how it's done. And so, um, two things then, really. Understanding the stuff is Native women's art and questioning that process and hopefully giving, we probably messed up a bunch of stuff, we didn't do, there's many things that we could have done better, blah, blah, but at least there's a kind of an outline now that there is a way to do it. I know some of you have probably read about that show at the Chicago Art Institute that just got nixed because it's a whole exhibit, exhibit of Membrae's pottery you know who would know that that was a problematic show? <laughs> the descendants of those people would know that and could have stopped that show. I mean, this thing was to open a month from now and they called it off. And they finally clued in that it was problematic. To not have Native advisors on an exhibit like that is outrageous, right? So anyway, this is, this is, the, this is the fight that, I've been, that we've been having. And, um, Point is, is that the exhibit opens on June 1st. There is a catalog. Um, SAR is doing a tour, and there is spaces on that. If you do the tour, you actually might get into the lectures and all of that, because um, it's looking pretty popular already. Um, we've got some really good press. You look in, in Art in America, and the New York Times, and all the big mags. Um, I think it really struck a nerve. We were supposed to open this exhibit uh, to, we were supposed to open this exhibit when Hillary Clinton was to be president. That, that, that's, that was it. So we were like, oh, you're the woman, you know? It, like, it, was, it was kind of in Europe, here, women, blah. And then what happened, happened. Now I think that, I actually think that now is when it's supposed to open. Now we can work as some sort of medicine on this whole situation that we are all yes. in now. So, <laughs> we'll come to the show, buy the catalog, um, well, it's going to be opening at the Minneapolis Institute of Art in June. Um, June 2nd is when it opens. Then it goes to the Frist in Tennessee. The Frist is like Site Santa Fe. It doesn't have a permanent collection, but they have a huge space. Um, then it is going to the Renwick, and then it is going to the Philbrook in Tulsa. No, it is not coming here. No, we, we, um, we shopped it around. It's very expensive. One of, um, one of the main pieces is, okay, here, I'm just gonna give you the open <laughs> I'm just gonna, imagine this. imagine this, close your eyes, imagine this. Okay, this is Minneapolis Institute of Art, some have been, some have not. Imagine one of those big museums with the big halls, the big, the Wait, big. Is there a Dale Chihuly there? Yes. <laughs> just uh, is there a yeah, yeah, there is, I walked by. It. You didn't. All right, okay, so anyway, you're down the big marble halls, you're going past the Japanese and the Chinese art, and you see down at the end where the special target hall is, and you see Rose Simpson's Maria. And then right behind it, you see Maria Martinez. And then the opening of the exhibit. And you walk in, and above is the sky, and below is the earth, and there in the language is a greeting from those people, the Shakopee people, whose land you're on. Then you walk in, and you're greeted by two dresses, a growing thunder dress and an old Akama dress. And these women greet you, but yet, the exhibit is not just historic work in there. There's Tara Romero right there. Beyond that is, um, what else do we have in there? We did a walkthrough, or we did the whole, we have it plotted. Um, anyway, it's contemporary. It's through the present day. And it's all mingled together. We have a pair of quilled moccasins right next to this marble sculpture that this Chippewa lady did at the turn of the century. Very, you know, classical sculpture. And the thing that runs through all of that is the women's voices. So, that's my pitch. <laughs> Any kind of closing remarks or anything you'd like to share before we let people ask some questions? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having us. We really appreciate yeah, thank it. you to Alicia yeah, and Daniel you. and the SAR, SAR team here. It's great. So I guess um, for the next,
10, 15 minutes, we'll have questions if anyone has questions. I have two minutes. What brought your mother here? And you said you're using your art to fight. How do you do that? And what do you, what, what sense of accomplishment and what have you seen change from that? Um, mother came here because she fell in love with fantasy when we were little kids. And then when my parents divorced, she thought she could make a living here with the, with the skill set that she had. And uh, she did. She made a really good living here, made a community, knows many of the people in this room, worked here at SAR, volunteered here at SAR and all that. Um, and then, uh, I guess it's the stories that I tell in my art, um, that those are what's, con that's what connects. So I have a piece right now, it's an old piece, I did it in 2007 after all, um, after that horrible thing that happened in Fallujah. I don't know if anybody remembers that, but you remember when they strung the men up on that bridge? And all that payback that happened and how horrible that was? 2007, my baby was seven and three. And I'm looking at these little boys, knowing what I know about our warrior society, and I'm worrying. I'm already worrying about them boys getting involved in some American war that we got nothing to do with. Um, and so I made this piece called Prayer Blanket, and it is about our Kiowa, our Kiowa Black Leggings Society, our warrior society, but also kind of just addressing, like, in my own mind, trying to figure out, like, how, like, what, like, how come Native people in higher numbers per capita sign up for the military than any other race in the United States. Indian people serve at a higher rate than any other race in the United States. How come that is? How do we get over what well, we know? Because they were just stealing our oil from underneath our sand not too long ago, and now they're over there stealing that oil off out underneath that sand. And how does that all work together? How do we do, how, what is that, is it patriotism or whatever? And so that piece came together with that question in mind, that piece is going to be going to NMAI when they open up, I, I, I just sold it to them, it's going to NMAI when they open up the um, veterans section. So, and right now it's actually at the Chicago Veterans Museum in an exhibit of veterans art, and I'm one of only two non-veterans to have a piece in that, in that exhibit. And so that's what I mean. And I've had, that piece, every time I hang that, if I'm there personally, with, I have had I have had soldiers coming up and crying to me when they see it. So I know that I've struck a nerve with it. And that is, that's kind of, it's, it's more than just a question about Native Americans. It's, a, it's really a question about war, too, you know, and, and, and our place in the cosmos and all of this. And I don't know. Anyway, so in, in my humble opinion, that piece that she's talking about is actually the best piece that she's ever done. And, and she did it a while ago. You did it in 2007. 2007. But I mean, in my opinion, it's really, it's incredibly potent piece of art. Have yeah. you posted it? A picture of it? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the Chicago Veterans Museum website because I'm pretty sure they posted a picture of it because the show is still up. Okay. Yeah. I have a question for you about going from Skinny Beavers to the Rhode Island School of Design. You're scared of me. <laughs> I, I want your experience, but the context for that is I, I work in education and I'm interested in creating opportunities for Native American children and there are organizations that are working for the colleges to bring in diversity and Native Americans and yet there's, um, it, there's not always a track record of success and happiness in those very divergent environments. Yeah. The boarding school I went to, and it's a very small boarding school, and it, um, it's outside of Boston, and Helen Keller is the one who started it, so all of our, our classes were taught in ASL also, and, um, and their whole thing is diversity. Diversity, diversity, diversity. They're, you know, East Coast is like filled with those like crusty prep, prep schools, and their thing is like this is, you know, in the, in the, in the, um, following Helen Keller's desire that everyone should have an education, that it should be, uh, I graduated in 90, I'm the last Native person who's gone there. It's, we're in 2019, right? So, I, that's a really good question, I don't know, you know, like, I don't know, there's, I don't know how to answer that. I, I, I is a really great school. <laughs> I would say involving Native people yeah, involving in all of these yeah. levels of whatever you're yeah. doing, that's how you answer those questions. You can't have an outside person come in and say, hey, we're going to fix you people. Guess what? 
<clears throat> no, you're not. <laughs> Um, we, we listen to the native uh, um, radio station in Albuquerque a lot. They're always talking about repatriating uh, items on that on that uh, station. And I wonder, should those beautiful objects that you're talking about that are in the Met, which I have to say, I've seen a lot now because they kept going back just to see those objects. Should they even be there at all, is my question. Good question. Good question. I went to over 20 different museums looking through their collections. And now I knew this stuff was out there. I know, I've been in collections, I've been in a few. I've been to NMAI before. You don't know until you've gone to over 20 of them and you see drawer after drawer after drawer, cabinet after cabinet after cabinet, things locked away in the dark. No one knows they're there, no one sees them. No one touches them, no one handles them, no one uses them in any way, shape, or form other than their collections of this entity that is the United States, you know, that is whatever these museums are. I don't know. Um, the impulse to collect these things was, you know, to collect the dying humans of this North American continent. Um, you know, that's, it's all false. Yeah, it's like there's, yeah, and, and so, right, it's ownership. Um, Ownership of the of the identity. Mm -hmm. Who is an American, right? Museums help us understand who we are as humans, as Americans, as whatever. And so when you have these museums and they're packed to the gills, to the point like I was up at Denver Natural History and I can't even tell you how they were trading their stuff up there, right? You know, and this is stuff that never gets seen. It's not out on the floor. It's <laughs> never out on the floor. Why do you have it? What's the purpose of it? Isn't there functionality? It's, it's about function, right? It's not just about art, it's also about function as well. It's part of the living, the living part of everyday life. So if it's sitting in a drawer, um, where is, how is it in a way being true to its own right. intention? Yeah, the intentions there are, yes. So that, that's a really good question. Exactly. Why are there cabinets and drawers full of this stuff by the acre across this nation? What is the purpose of continuing to hold on to it? Repatriating it, repatriation works this way. Oh, you want your stuff back? Guess what? You need an air quality controlled unit area to put it in like a museum, or you can't have it back. So in New Zealand, I don't know if anyone's been to New Zealand, uh, the museum systems there work in a, they function in a different way. Um, the Maoris, are able to come in. There's a, there's a position at the museum that, and I, feel, I forget the Maori language for it, but the title is Old Woman. So it's basically her position at that museum is to just be there with these objects. And then if they need those objects for ceremonial purposes, people from the Marae come and they get those objects and they take them back to the Marae and they use those objects and then they, so it's more like their storage in a way. It's a repository. It's a repository. Not a depository. And that's, that's, that's a, a very that's in, interesting, you know. Like, although I have mentioned this to non-native curators, and they laugh at me, and I find that like it's just so like if you really want our opinion about how we should be dealing with this stuff or whatever, there's there is look to the Maori. You know, yeah, I would say look to the Maori. The, like our ancestors in Aotearoa, they actually gave us back our cape, feather cape of Kalani Opu. Because it belonged back home because it's a living object. Yeah. Right. You know, and it needs to be with our people. Right. So, yeah. It's kind of like at the wheel right where I work. Um, we have a, we were donated <laughs> some Pueblo embroidery, and there's a family that still, when it was stipulated they were given, the grandma that made it, her granddaughter still comes and borrows the manta, they clean it, and then they return it to the collection. So, and there's never been an issue like, oh no, they're gonna steal it, you know? Um, they won't know how to take things. care of it. Yeah, yeah that it needs to be climate controlled, blah, 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 with rubber gloves on it. It's kind of neat how that happens. Yes? Terry, about eight to 10 years ago, you shared the story with me that I would like for everyone here to be able to hear, and it was about a piece of a bag that you had commissioned that ended up in New Mexico. Oh um, yeah. Um, so, my friend America Meredith, who does First American Art Magazine, if you don't have a subscription to it, go right out and get one. 
Um, there's the best native art magazine out there at the moment, if you ask me, my humble opinion. FAM, F, uh, First American Art Magazine. FAM, because we're all FAM. Um, uh, America asked, this is, a, this is a long version of the story, America asked me to be a part of a show about the FBI in Indian country. So I went online and I'm Google searching COINTELPRO and AIM and all that stuff. I get a phone call within a week from the State Department. I literally almost poop my pants. I'm like, oh my god, did I just get blacklisted? Like, are the FBI coming? Like, what on earth did I like my Google searches? Turns out the State Department deals with gifting between, one of the things that they do is they deal with the gifting between um, nations our nation and other nations. And so Mrs. Obama was going, this is, Ms. this is Obama years, Mrs. Obama was going down to Mexico, this was in the very first term, to go meet and greet with the president and his wife, and she wanted to bring a gift. And she wanted a gift of Native American women's art to be the gift exchange between the North and the South. And she'd heard that the First Lady of Mexico liked indigenous work, women's work. And so they called me up. And they asked me if I could send a selection of evening bags, because at the time I was doing this whole line of evening bags. And uh, I sent them a selection, and I didn't think anything about it. Um, and then about, I don't know when it was, it was months later, I thought, oh, I'm going to Google search Mexico, First Lady, whatever. I put it in, and all these AP photographs show up. And it turns out that when President Calderon and his wife came up for their first official state dinner here in the United States at the White House, she brought that purse with her and had an evening gown that was made that matched it. And so there's all these beautiful photographs of the Obamas and, the, and Calderon and his wife standing on the steps of the White House looking beautiful with my purse right there. <laughs> so um, I was incredibly honored um, to find that out. I, here in the United States, they don't actually publicize that stuff because we're not like England where it's the royal you know, wheat cakes of the first the queen or whatever. It, it's not like that. Um, <laughs> Which is a good thing, right? You know, like our, our, our people, can, well, whatever, I don't know what's happening now, but our people normally wouldn't be able to take gifts from Saudi princes and whatever, you know? Um, but, <laughs> anyway, we can figure out all this stuff. So this is the, I just was incredibly honored that that, that that symbolic gift between those women, between Mrs. Obama, the first first lady of color, between the North and the South, was a gift of indigenous women's work and my work. Mm -hmm. But did they acknowledge it? She didn't, Mrs. Obama didn't write you? No. No, because here in the United States, when our government officials get gifted or gift anything, that is all done with private money. It is not done through the government or government money. So if they gave them stuff too, and that all goes into a big room, and then at the end of the term, the president and his wife can use their own money and go buy some of the things that were gifted to them. That way, it's all on the up and up. Well, the gifts are on the State Department website. Right. You can exactly. It's totally searchable. You can find all that stuff out. Well, it was. <laughs> Right. I think we can take one or two more questions. Sure. What What is your What is your opinion of the 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 native art that is in the fashion industry today that is used? The native sometimes art. either well or not. Um, I, I Carrie, I know you and your former apprentice Tanya had um, some connection to Vogue. Yeah. Okay. She was just Tanya. I'm very proud of her. Do a little plug for her. She was just in British Vogue. She was actually featured in, the, in British Vogue. So I'm to understand your question. You're asking you sort of what's your feeling about expansion or, or use in the larger. I think when natives do it, it's really a good thing. Yeah. I think native 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 made design is really an amazing thing. And in the fashion world, as I said earlier, I think fashion and adornment is a really palpable, really interactive venue to communicate. And when it's being ripped off, which it is consistently and always ripped off, there was that figure or whatever, I forget the name of this, it's some major design house, and, I, and she literally took Sue moccasins and, I, and um, I think a pair of Anishinaabe moccasins and stuff, and literally had them copied, made in India, 
and put them in, in, the, in Saks Fifth Avenue and, you know, whatever. And because of the beauty of the internet, because of the beauty of social media, a bunch of Native people got on her Instagram. And every time she posted that, we were all like, thief, 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 thief. <laughs> and we were like putting up images of the actual pair of moccasins. Someone dug it up next to hers. Within like 24 hours, they got taken down off the website. We wrote letters to the to the um, I forget everything with Bergdorf Gorman or Goodman yeah. or and and uh, so there's I think a, a a voice there, but it's just constant. It's consistently being ripped off, and it's just like a constant issue. That's why I think that more natives should be in the fashion industry. That there should be more of a native voice in the fashion industry. And our 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 voice in the fashion industry is not these antique moccasins that are reproduced to, for some chick to wear the uh, concert Coachella, or Coachella or whatever they go to. Like, but it, you know, it's actually inspired you know, into really interesting forms and interesting designs yeah, that are... We're contemporary yeah. moccasins to Coachella. Yeah. 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 Beaded tennis shoes to Coachella. Yeah. Or something, you know, that, or, you know uh, like it doesn't... Like I, when I first started making jewelry, it was... Um, I cannot tell you how many people came up to my booth and told me it was not native jewelry. You're not making native jewelry. What are you doing? How, how is your market going? Because this isn't native jewelry. Because it didn't include turquoise. Because it didn't include whatever their opinion of what native jewelry was. So the same thing in fashion. Native fashion is not necessarily moccasins and fringe and buckskin. It's a lot of many things. And the more I think more native should be in fashion. And and you know whether it's t-shirts, sportswear, or you know, or actually translating a buckskin dress into an evening dress, couture, like Rolando. Yeah, like Rolando. Exactly. Yes, exactly. All right. Any any last one? Okay, sure. Thank you, um, Carrie. You did a uh, wonderful collaboration with Jamie Okuma. Uh, is there any collaboration going to be done with your sister? Um, I've done about eight collaborations with Jamie, and um, we'll probably collaborate again depending on our schedules and like what our thing is. Terry and I have, have talked about doing collaborations, and I bought a bunch of sapphires for a fish, which she's never really like gotten to her half. So collaborations um, for are really I love doing them, and for um, one of the ways and the way I love doing them is this is I'll do my thing, you do your thing. And then it comes together, and like anything, it'll happen when it's meant to happen. So, you know, eventually I know that we'll do something together, but who knows what it's going to be. Maybe it'll be a buckskin dress for our new daughter-in-law, you know? Like it might be... I'll um, do a yeah. on that. Yeah, exactly. So it might... So, yeah, the cradle board yeah, for, for yeah. our grandsons. Cradle board for our grandsons. Grand <laughs> <laughs> My kids are only very young. They're not now. Not now. Not now. Not now. Not now. Wow. I'm like, what? You didn't tell me nothing. <laughs> no, 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 no. Someday, way in the future. Yeah. So yeah, I, you know, maybe. All right. Well, thanks for listening. We'll turn it back to Alicia and see if there's anything else. Thank you.